back to Powers' Jeep Shop. Today we are going to be focusing on the Cherokee. Uh, hopefully going to drop the uh, oil pan and maybe get to removing the oil pump. And we'll see how things go because it's probably going to be a pain. And it's probably going to be a lot of swearing and a lot of getting angry uh, trying to get the pan off. But... We'll see how that goes, and if all goes well, maybe we'll actually start on some of the pulling some of the components off so we can do the rear main seal. But uh, it's definitely going to be all Cherokee today, and I want to try to make some serious progress on that. So without further ado, we'll move on to a little close up on the pan and start working. All right, I'm doing a. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of post commentary for this video for kind of two reasons. Uh, one is audio quality. The microphone I have that I'm using right now is uh, much better than a little internal microphone on a uh, GoPro. It's going to be a lot more work for me, but uh, it makes the most sense for uh, what I want to do. Even though it feels a bit disjointed for me. Uh, personally, because uh, what I'm saying to you right now doesn't really correspond to what I'm saying in the video, if I'm talking at all. But uh, this makes the most sense to me. And I'll start off with apologizing for the uh, the rays of God that are coming from the right side of the screen but at this time. But uh, that's just kind of the camera angle I chose at the perfect time of day for that to happen. So anyway, uh, what I'm discussing right now in this uh, part of the video is that looking underneath, I can see a lot of oil. I can see uh, on both sides, the driver and passenger side, all everywhere there's oil. And it doesn't really come much of a surprise to me. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure that this... Uh, uh, pan seal and other parts uh, that are on this motor are probably from the factory. I'm sure it hasn't been replaced at all. So it's not surprising that they're leaking and there's lots of oil. But um, the one thing I noted is uh, Jeep, when they were making the Cherokee, I don't know what it is. Uh, marketing ease of uh, production or what specific reason but at this point in time jeep when they put something together seemed to just use whatever they had like it looks like the person putting it together just grabbed a handful of bolts both metric and standard and put it together and that's what they do like this the oil pan is a mixture of 11 millimeter uh, seven sixteenths and half inch. There's four half inch main bolts. There's a bunch of uh, seven sixteenths that have like little studs on them. So you need a deep socket. And those seem like they had uh, a couple of them had plastic clips for holding lines, which mine, of course, uh, being an old Jeep that uh, has seen some usage, and this is actually not the original motor that came with the Jeep. It's actually out of a 2000 Grand Cherokee. Uh, it doesn't actually hold any lines, so I just pulled them off. But I don't know if that's the only purpose for those studded ones, but it seems uh, a bit strange. And it's found all over the vehicle. It's <laughs> You would think that like one side's... It's the same as another and it's different it's, it's crazy but uh, as you can see here I start to kind of uh, loosen the oil pan bolts and uh, we'll do a little fast forward sequence through this to me taking off the pan okay now uh, as you can see I've uh, started loosening up the bolts and then what I decided to do is as I pulled the bolts out I was gonna put them or I, I actually did put them on a plank of wood that I just had laying conveniently uh, next to the Jeep and I just laid them out in the order as I took them out in the same general shape and I marked uh, 
driver, front, back, and uh, side, side, like I said. And uh, you'll be able to see exactly how I did it in the uh, lower left-hand corner there uh, with this picture. And that's pretty much how I just kind of kept track of uh, how uh, the bolts were. Uh, if you wanted to do it the 100% uh, correct way, which I, since I knew I was going to be the only one in the garage working at the time, I didn't have to worry about it being knocked over or moved. Uh, you would want to put it in cardboard and label it and just poke the bolts through, less likely to uh, have something go wrong that way. And so what I did was a little bit of a... Uh, a last minute thought and uh, in hindsight I probably should put them in cardboard just to be safe uh, but as I pull off these bolts uh, I'm just kinda mentally preparing myself for the task of removing the pan and as I get to uh, the actual removal of the pan uh, one thing I uh, noted like I thought of after the fact of uh, working on it and pulling the pan and uh, I was about halfway through I realized that everything would have been probably a thousand times easier if I would have just had the foresight to remove the sway bar links which I have quick disconnects in there uh, which would make this ascent the suspension droop out a lot more than it does uh, with the, the sway bar connected. And what that would do is that would drop the axle at least another, I don't know, like a few inches. Like, and that's being conservative. It's The difference uh, is pretty huge, and that's why the quick, quick disconnects are theirs for when I do go off-roading. You pull those and you get so much more suspension travel. So in hindsight, I probably should have did that, and some of the issues I had getting the oil pan out, which you'll see here, uh, me struggling with it so desperately, uh, I probably wouldn't have had any of those. But uh, as I kind of skip ahead to uh, the kind of realization moment of how to remove it with what I did... Uh, it's what I ended up having to do is get it in such a way that I could shove it forward and towards the driver's side and pretty much go until the oil pickup hit the back of the pan. And then what I could do from there is tilt the uh, front of the oil pan up and allow me to drop the back of the pan back out uh, and clear the transmission tunnel. Uh, or not really, the uh, not the tunnel, but the housing. And it took me really long to kind of figure that out and probably would have been a non-issue if I did disconnect the sway bar links. But... Uh, in case you are privileged enough like <laughs> I am to have a lift and you're in this kind of situation, uh, remove the sway bar disconnects because uh, that'll make your life a lot easier. Even if you're jacking it up and working on the ground, it's a good thing to do because you can, as you lift it up and put it up on some blocks, which I've had to do before I got my lifts, it's, it's not a fun thing to do, but it can be done is you throw it up on blocks and especially with like the uh, uh, rock rails I have on there that would be perfect place to throw the blocks and have the suspension droop out so that way uh, you get as much room as you can so uh, now that I have the pan out it's uh, a bit of inspection time to kind of look under the bottom end of my motor uh, just a little video of uh, degreasing the pan and there's that pinch and uh, much probably much better clarity I was talking about when I took the oil pan off that's where the bumper uh, in there so yeah that's bad all 
Alright, after removing the pan, I moved on to inspecting the engine and confirming that it is indeed an engine. It has a crankshaft, it has pistons, they all appear to be intact. So I moved on to the next step, which is removing the oil pump which came out relatively easily. I spilled oil on the floor because I'm me. And uh, the only thing I noticed was there was a hole uh, in the oil pump gasket, which appeared to be superficial, but I'm not entirely sure if that was causing any issues with low oil pressure at all. But I won't know because I have an idiot light that doesn't work. So uh, I would go on from here to the next step. Alright, the next step in making these repairs I'm doing is to remove the girdle, which is the long bar that goes through along the center of the motor, which connects all the bearing caps uh, from the very front to the very rear and provides some protection as well as some uh, structure to uh, the motor and it's actually a telltale sign that my motor is not original to my Cherokee which my Cherokee is a 95 uh, Cherokee which these girdles are typically only found in motors in 96 and newer uh, Cherokees and uh, I don't think I've talked I think I talked about this uh, either later or early in the video I'm not quite sure but it's a uh, my motor is actually out of a 2000 Grand Cherokee because when I originally bought the Jeep, when I before I could even drive, it had a blown head gasket, and we did the engine swap with a motor that I found for 400 bucks. And actually, when we tore apart my old motor, we actually had to remove the head off the motor to gain access to some of the uh, back, the top back. Uh, bolts holding the engine to the transmission which are reverse torques which are the worst pieces of crap known to mankind but when we removed the head from the engine we actually found a quarter sized hole in the number five uh, cylinder which if I can find the picture I'll put up right now and uh, after this girdle is removed, we can move on to the rear bearing cap, or the very last bearing cap to the back of the motor, where the lower half of the rear main seal is located. All right, now we get to the final bit of disassembly while the Jeep's on the lift, which is to remove the final bearing cap, which houses the lower, or just houses the rear main seal. Uh, the upper half of the rear main seal is actually inside of the engine block. You have to push it in and the lower part of the rear main seal is in the bearing cap which you'll be able to see all right so uh it came out relatively difficult i would say it was it wasn't too bad but it was uh it was a little bit difficult just because you're trying to be careful because if you're too forceful and you break it off and you drop it eh, bad things happen so you have to be able to put enough force to break it loose uh, from where it's oh, at, but go. not too much that you lose your grip on it and then cause yourself a world of hurt. So, lower half of the rear main seal out. After Ooh. I removed the rear uh, main or the rear bearing cap, it was a matter of removing the rear main seal from that which uh, was a little bit difficult once again because I've never done this before and I'm trying to be careful 
as I do things to not mar any of the bearing surface and uh, just trying not to screw anything up and it's kind of made difficult by the fact that they put the little metal rod in there and I watched some videos prior to just give myself a little bit of background knowledge on how to do this and you watch them do it and they just it just shows them hammering and it probably took them just as long as it took me but the way they show it it looks like it's the easiest thing ever you just tap with a hammer and it goes right in and out no no it doesn't work that way it's a struggle i actually uh seal out now onto uh, d1 in the motor which is a little more uh, nerve-wracking a prime example of uh kind of what i'm talking about with uh, how the kind of how-to videos make things a little simplified i guess is you watch them hammer out the upper part of the uh, rear main seal which i am not even gonna show the video footage from that because it is over half an hour of me sitting there with a hammer and a punch trying to hit a target the size of a gnat and it not budging at all and pretty much the only thing out of my mouth was obscenities so uh, nothing really worth showing there because you can't even really see anything all you see is me struggling and getting pissed off and actually me removing the upper part wasn't even shown uh, what I ended up having to do was I found a very thin screw that's like used for uh, hanging pictures like it goes into the expandable plastic nut for uh, going into sheetrock and I screwed that into the rubber part of the seal until I felt like it was uh, until I felt a decent amount of resistance and figured that should be enough because I don't want to go too far and mar any of the bearing surfaces or anything and pretty much just grabbed that with some locking pliers and yanked it out and it that pulled the screw through the rubber but it also pulled the seal out just enough where I can grab it with some pliers and pull the seal all the way out and it was frustrating extremely extremely frustrating but i got it out uh i probably could have bought a they have kits for removing uh gaskets and that probably would have worked a little bit better than the screw i used but uh my way sort of worked <laughs> so that's just kind of like one of the things you don't always see in the kind of instructional videos and once I finally got that out, I was able to uh, move on to the next step, which was to start uh, getting everything ready to be put back together. Time for the new rear main seal to go in. A second time. All right, now we move on to the more exciting uh, part of the whole project of tear well, actually tearing it down is uh, my favorite part. You get to see how things work and then you don't have to worry about when it goes back together if it's going to run or not because when you're putting it back together that's always in the back of your mind. Am I doing this correctly where it's going to run after I'm done? So. I always enjoy disassembly more than anything, but uh, it also is uh, the kind of light at the end of the tunnel feeling once you start putting it back together. So putting it back together is still good for me, uh, something I enjoy. So as I mentioned, I am putting in the upper part of the rear main seal, which is uh, intentionally a really tight fit because you're 
it's supposed to seal off the oil, <laughs> so uh, it's a struggle, and it's meant to be a struggle. Uh, I tried a couple different things, just doing it by hand, uh, using a punch uh, with a hammer, and I pretty much uh, after some struggling, ended up just going with uh, a punch just to get a little bit of leverage but using my hand to push the punch while using my other hand to hold the uh, side of the rear main seal to keep it from bending because that's what caused me to have to get a new rear main seal is because the first time I wasn't looking at what I was doing and it felt like it was going in but it wasn't going in and it was bending it bent and gouged itself on the uh, sharp edge where it goes in so uh, I kind of learned my lesson with that that I need to be conscious of it's going in and making sure it's not bending so uh, after I struggled a bit with this I managed to get it in and then I can move on to the next step which is bolting the lower half of the bearing uh, in place where uh, that is that goes and then torquing it down the spec so uh, I will now will transition to me torquing it down and uh, reading a bit online uh, I found that it's best to torque it down in stages of I think it was 40, 70, and then 80 foot-pounds and uh, I'll cut to me torquing it down because I'll do a little editing because I, I don't know why but the sound of a torque wrench clicking is just one of the one of those gratifying sounds that are you have no idea why it's gratifying but it is so you're doing three stages 40 70 and then 80 foot pounds so start off with 40 just get them taut first Alright, there's our first step. Uh, change torque specs on this. Alright, there we go. There's the main bearing torques back in the spec, back in place. Alright, the next step uh, after reinstalling the uh, rear bearing is to reinstall the girdle, which is extremely uh, entertaining for me because I got a lot of bolts I got to torque to spec, which uh, the spec for those, what I found online for my motor was 35 to 40 foot-pounds, so I think I set it to like 37, 38-ish. Um, and then just went to town. <laughs> so, enjoy this.
All right, and that is all of the bolts torque to 30, like six to 38 foot pounds. So on to the next step. All right, now with all the girdle bolts back in place and torque to spec, it's on to the kind of timed section, uh, which is putting the oil pan back on. And it's timed because uh, along with the uh, Felt Pro uh, gasket I was using, you put RTV, some high temp RTV, to uh, improve the seal on some of the uh, trouble areas like the very front of the pan and the very back of the pan and you pretty much just do the corners across the front uh, and the two corners in the back across the back on the pan and on the top of the gasket uh, just to make sure you get a good seal and one of the great things about the felt pro uh, gasket that I'm using is it has this little uh, kind of blue plastic uh, uh, I don't even know what to call them pins I guess that allow you to snap the gasket and the oil pan, pan into place which is wonderful if you're working on this alone like I was it makes it so you don't have to wrestle uh, with the pan and gasket when you're trying to line things up and especially when you're just uh, with the limited space you have to work it sometimes you have to kind of readjust your hands and normally that'd be a pain when you're trying to line everything up so it, it made a huge difference and it was actually uh, uh, the best like half a cent piece of plastic there is so uh, as you saw, I screwed them into place, and then uh, I set up the RTV, and I had cleaned uh, prior to doing the gir girdle bolts. I actually went around with a razor blade on the engine block, removing any grease, uh, any remaining uh, gasket that was there. And I did the same on the oil pan, along with degreasing the oil pan, which you saw the results of that uh, earlier in the video when I showed where the upper control arm pinched the oil pan, which still concerns me. I gotta make sure I get bump stops so that doesn't happen again, because if it went any deeper, it would have punctured the oil pan. <laughs> and yeah, that's never a good thing. Uh, so anyway... You, uh, after I got that, uh, I got it in place, snapped it, as uh, you can see right about now, I'm probably snapping it into place, and then starting all the bolts and pulling them pretty much off the plank where I had them, and going around the block and just kind of getting them um, hand tight and getting it ready for tor torquing them down the spec, which just was weird because they get, I think it was uh, 11 foot pounds for the 11 millimeter bolts, the and for the half inch bolts, and the 7 16 bolts get 8 foot pounds. And it just feels like they're hand tight when you're doing that. Uh, and actually, I had a uh, a cheap kind of uh, I, it's it was for like motorcycle engines. It was in inch pounds or whatever, and I had that, and I thought that would be perfect for this situation. But it turns out it would only go as low as ten foot pounds. And when I set that up, I actually ended up over torquing one of the bolts because I was like this feels like it's way more than it should be and I I just so happened to have another torque wrench that went lower down to five foot pounds and I've decided to test it with that and sure enough I over torqued that one bolt so I decided to use the other torque wrench since that one's more I think is more accurate I really don't know 
It's like, uh, yep, it clicked. It's definitely at five foot pounds. Or it could be seven foot pounds. It could be ten foot pounds. I don't know. <laughs> Do you really know how tight it is? No. You just trust that the click is at the right uh, torque. But I digress. Uh, so uh, one thing that happened uh, during this time, which I'll, I'll comb through the video and very co closely and see if I can see it, but one of the bolts I put in apparently didn't actually thread in. So when I went to tighten a little better with the socket on the extension, I noticed it was gone. <laughs> and that's when the panic started to set in. And because remember, I'm on a kind of a timeline here because I had put the RTV down and the pan's already in place. So that RTV's RTV is gonna dry. It's <laughs> that's uh there ain't no there you're not gonna pull that off. You're gonna get a new gasket is what's gonna happen if you don't uh have the time. Luckily for me, I have a spare motor <laughs> that uh I had actually got a whole Jeep for Cherokee like mine, same year, same color, everything. Five hundred dollars, so I had a second version of my jeep for five hundred dollars completely stripped it down so i have that and i pulled one of the oil pan bolts out of the spare motor and quick threw that in and i can probably show you uh, me running around with my head cut off trying to get that together <laughs> but uh it's it was in a uh interesting panic inducing uh situation that was all right the jeep is now on the ground because uh, when i recorded that last last audio bit i had forgotten the fact that uh i law the gopro stopped working and just wouldn't record had battery had memory just for whatever reason wouldn't record so I, I didn't have time to fiddle with it I wanted to get done so I finished up what I was doing and then moved on and uh, after a little bit of time after I got the oil pan on I fiddled with it got it working again and started the last little bit of the planned uh, repairs which keyword there planned um, which was the oil relocator bracket which I had done once before and just the you probably it's a little bit difficult to see in the video but what I uh, had done for anyone that has a Cherokee and wants to do this it's a very low clearance area to get to so what I did was I took a I forget what the T uh, I think it's a T50 Torx bit uh, that the bolt is and I punched out the actual bit itself from the socket and then put that into a one of those like a pass through ratchet wrenches that you can get from Sears as a craftsman makes them but it's so the bolt can go through the ratchet head and that has fits in there perfect and then you just have to put a big socket over top of the handle of that with some ratchet extensions as you can see in the video and it pops right off in a couple of minutes and i don't want to talk about how long it took me to get to that point but uh i go through that and we'll uh I'll kind of breeze through this because it's not a very interesting video. All I do is I pull it off, replace an O-ring that's uh, inside of it, and put it back on, and replace the oil filter uh, with a new one. And then after I do that, I start up the motor, and I think I'll let the GoPro footage speak for itself, or... Don't listen to me if that's not the case, and I'll be back talking to you through this mic in post-production.
actually trying a different filter than typical Fram filter. Uh, and just for the heck of it, I saw it and figured I'd try it out. And it's already got one point going for it. It's got this textured paint, which is actually pretty awesome. All right, get that stupid vacuum line out of the way. I'm only going to do hand type because with that textured paint on it, you get a good grip and you can actually tighten that son of a gun down pretty tight. That's pretty awesome. I approve. Nice little, uh, not sponsored, but it just worked out perfectly that their label popped up at the top. <laughs> Ah, oh, look at this sensor. This sensor, ooh. Huh. Well, that's useful. I don't know if this sensor would actually work with that kind of kink. But, uh, doesn't matter. This is a base model Cherokee, so I only have an idiot light anyway. So, all it's going to tell me is low pressure, and I'll know that because the engine exploded or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's alright, I have a spare, which is now missing a uh, oil pan bolt. And if you don't know if you can hear that rain. Alright, this, ladies and gentlemen is my engine bay again and this is why you try to pay attention unlike me and you don't do a bunch of extra work for no reason so basically I got the motor running and if you can see down below there I don't know if you can see there's a little pool of oil and it happens to be the source is that remember that kind of crummy connect connection I noticed yeah that's where it's leaking uh, this bright yellow oil filter came dual purpose it's really nice and grippy and it shows oil really well <laughs> and not to mention I could see it dripping from there and I had noticed it drip there once or twice before but I didn't think anything of it because it was like one or two drops I saw and I was like that can't make up all the oil that I'm seeing but I guess at higher RPMs and when I'm driving, it comes out of there more like a fountain than it does uh, dripping. So, yeah. I went through all that trouble for a little adapter that, or a little sensor I could replace in, I don't know, 20 minutes. So, there's your lesson, kids. Uh, always pay attention and find where the leak is coming from. Not just assume. <laughs> so... Uh, the good news is I have a brand new rear main seal and a brand new oil pump for this uh, motor, which will be handy and run it for the rest of its life. So, not a terrible thing. Uh, all that work needed to be done eventually. I just prematurely did it because I thought there was an issue. So, yay! Science. Paying attention. Uh, things I don't do. Woo! So, that spare motor that I stole a bolt, oil pan bolt from, also has a spare oil pressure sensor, which happened to be leaking. So, yay for that. I guess it's time to start the motor and see if it leaks. So, uh, people that know me, uh, will know that as a familiar site of antifreeze underneath where the Jeep used to be. And that was a minor heart attack of while I was letting it idle and just making sure it wasn't leaking oil. I come back and look underneath and I see a giant puddle of fluid and immediately think the worst that it's oil and going, oh no, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? What, what happened? Realize that the uh, overflow uh, hose that goes to the catch reservoir was disconnected, so it was just dumping uh, antifreeze vapor and antifreeze eventually because it was open, 
uh, once it got hot and just dumped the antifreeze. So, uh, minor heart attack, but it, it wouldn't be me working on my Jeep without antifreeze somehow ending up on me or the floor. And that's kind of how I got the nickname Overheating. Well, I made myself kind of the nickname Overheating Slacker because uh, the back of the Jeep there, it says Slacker on it. It used to say Slacker Off-Road, but uh, Slacker seemed to fit me better. So, uh, since I'm always overheating and losing antifreeze, I figured Overheating Slacker just fits. that I'm pretty sure I know the oil doesn't work and I know the temperature one doesn't work but the battery one works and the one over there that doesn't do anything does uh, works I think maybe possibly but uh, this is I've driven it to work twice now as I'll get out here's the Subaru but as you can see underneath there is no puddles it is bone dry so the old girl is uh, running strong and I'm glad that I fixed that issue so just figured I'd show you this little update after driven it to work twice now uh, granted that's only six miles <laughs> or sorry uh, 12 miles of driving but uh, I'm sure if I put more miles on I'll confirm more that I fixed the issue so there's a little update for you. 